Something strange has happened to sport touring motorcycles. When I first started riding, they used to be pretty simple. There were big couches like the BMW R1100 RT and the Honda ST1100. And the smaller sport bikes with bags like the Honda VFR800 and the Triumph Sprint ST955i. Sport tours were very popular and if you like what came to the left of the hyphen, you got one of the smaller sport bikes with bags. And if you liked what came to the right, you got one of the big boys. And the big boys are still around. BMW's RT has grown to 1250cc, the Yamaha FJR 1300 has been around what seems like forever, as has the Concourse 14 from Kawasaki. The bigger bikes are all great long haul motorcycles, extremely comfortable and capable of iron butt feats, but they are also expensive and heavy, and if you want a sport bike with bags, these ain't for you. So what can you get? The VFR 800, long gone from the North American market. The Ducati Super Sport, KTM 1290 Super Duke GT and Kawasaki's H2SX, all pretty pricey. I'm a value conscious consumer so I want the most bike for the least money. But the smaller sport tours seem to have lost market share and the blame falls on one culprit. The 2010 Ducati Multistrada. Why? Well, in that year Ducati decided to update their butt ugly original Multistrada. And while thinking they were building an adventure bike to take on the BMW R1200 GS, they inadvertently built the next generation sport tour. The Adventure Sport Tour. After the Multistrada came the Kawasaki Versus 1000, Yamaha Tracer, etc, etc. Suddenly the new batch of sport tourers were wearing adventure bike costumes, had roomy upright riding positions and were eating up traditional sport tourer sales. The Triumph Sprint was gone, as was the BMW F800 ST, and finally, so was the original bike in the class, the VFR 800, from my local market anyways. But there is one bike left in the inexpensive small sport touring category, and I lived with it for a week and put over 1200 kilometers on it. So let's look at the Ninja 1000 SX and see if the sport tourer with the emphasis on sport is still a viable platform, or if it's going the way of its brethren. Also, only a small percentage of the viewers of this channel are subscribed, so if you like the content, please consider hitting that button, liking the video and following us on the gram. Now let's check out this long distance crotch rocket. Few motorcycles carry the cachet of the Ninja name. It makes prepubescent boys quiver with excitement and insurance agents shiver in fear. Remember the ZX11, 12, 14? In fact, can you remember a time when Kawasaki didn't have a bike in the running for the fastest motorcycle in the world? Not since the Z1 came out in 72. A bike which was affectionately named the Widowmaker due to the fact that it had an engine appropriate for F1 and brakes appropriate for BMX. Having ridden the Ninja 1000 SX for a week, I've gotten to know it pretty well. I put more than 1200 kilometers on it in all capacities and conditions and can honestly say that I've acquired an owner's perspective. Did I like it? Very much so. It's by no means perfect, but if you're looking for a fast touring bike with a lot of features that can make you feel like Valentino Rossi, you get a lot of bike for not a lot of money with this one. So the base Ninja 1000 SX will run you 15,000 Canadian plus 200 for paint other than Kawasaki Green and 1000 for the luggage. If my American viewers are wondering, that's a 12,600 US base price for a bike in green with no bags. What do you get for your money? Well, a whole lot as a matter of fact. We're looking at a bike with a 518 pound wet weight, 140 horsepower, 82 pound feet of torque, 3 rider modes, quick shifter, slipper clutch, cruise control, lean sensitive ABS, traction and cornering control, and smartphone connectivity to Kawasaki's Rideology app. And it's got Japanese reliability, which in my book is worth a lot. But you don't tune into this channel to hear me read a spec sheet. I like to tell the average rider what to expect, so let's get to it. First, this bike has all the performance you could possibly want for real life riding. 140 horsepower is enough to get all the thrills you'll ever want on the highway or a twisty road. There are more powerful bikes out there, but in this range we're splitting hairs. The 200 horsepower bikes require so much more electronic taming to make them rideable that the seat of the pants difference is not that great. They will rarely give you the full 200 because they know if they did, you might kill yourself. 
The 1000 SX has the classic Japanese inline 4 engine, 1043cc and performs accordingly. Because the engine is so big it will pull from very low revs. However, above 6000 RPM is where the real party starts and it rocks and rolls all the way to the 11000 RPM redline. The torque peak hits at 8000 and the horsepower peak arrives at 10. Honestly, the bike feels like a more comfortable, slightly heavier superbike. Get the revs up and hold on. It'll keep up with most bikes in a straight line and, if well ridden, in the curves as well. Will a superbike or supersport lap a track faster? Sure, but that's the only thing those bikes do better than this one. On the road they're uncomfortable to ride and are no faster. Why? Because on the road the limiting factor isn't the performance of the bike but the rider's instinct for self-preservation. Every corner becomes a calculation between the thrill of riding and an estimation of how long it will take you to stop if there's a deer or car in your lane around the next bend. You're never flat out on the road, or you shouldn't be if you want to live long. And that's where bikes like the Ninja 1000 come in. They make you feel like a superbike racer, you can even take them to the track, but you can also spend hours touring on them. Just lift the windshield, set the cruise control and settle in. So let's go over what this bike is and what it isn't. First the looks. These are subjective but I like them. Kawasaki redesigned this bike last year and I'm a fan of the headlight design and overall shape. I like that there is no visible bag mounting hardware to ruin the lines a la Ducati Super Sport. Take them off and there's no hint that you're riding something practical. With a tail tidy to clean up the rear it will look properly sleek. Speaking of sleek, apparently governments around the world require motorcycle exhaust to approach the size and weight of a SpaceX rocket. Wondering about the sound? Definitely wheezy. I used to have an Akrapovic on my old 600 and can tell you that an inline 4 can sound magical with a proper can. Replace this monstrosity as soon as you can and you will hear sweet sweet music. From the saddle on the other hand, the intake noise sounds properly menacing. Kawasaki has always managed to make its bikes sound good to the rider. Rider modes. Rain is there only for the heaviest of weather and I only use it in a complete deluge. In slightly wet conditions I ran it in road mode. Power response in this mode is smooth and traction control is dialed back. Sport is for aggressive riding, mostly on the track. Don't have it in sport when you're wanting to make tight maneuvers in a parking lot or a U-turn on a narrow two lane. This mode is too jumpy at walking speeds. I'm a fan of riding smoothly and trying to flow around the bends. For this the road mode suited my riding style and I just left it there most of the time. Sport was fun but sometimes you just want to cruise. Speaking of cruising, every touring bike could benefit from having the Ninja's cruise control. Everything worked as it should and on the long ride like the one to my cottage it was very welcome. I took the big Ninja up to the cottage because that's where you can find limitless twisty roads with very limited traffic. Almost no traffic in fact. These are the kind of roads that this bike was built for and I certainly enjoyed myself on it. What did I find out? It's happiest on flowy bends where it can transition directions smoothly. On very tight turns the 500 pound wet weight begins to tell and you have to muscle it into the corners. It'll do it but it's not as nimble as a 400 pound naked bike. What about the suspension and brakes? They're good for this price range. They're no Brembo's and Olin's but they don't hold you back from having fun on your ride. The brakes are not as aggressive as superbike brakes which is a good thing as overly sensitive brakes can get you into trouble at slow speeds. The suspension ate up most of the bumps that came its way. A couple of times the back end squirmed going over bumps in a corner but I didn't have any real oh crap moments. Another thing that belies this bike's price point is the Collar TFT Dash. It's well laid out and contains a wealth of information about your fuel consumption, range and even lean angles on your last ride. Modes are easy to switch and a fourth rider mode can be customized for your riding style. You can Bluetooth your phone to the bike and fine tune your settings as you like. Or if you're into numbers, access all types of telemetry and data from every part of your trip. So the bike looks good, accelerates, handles and brakes well and feels quite sporty. Other details. The fairing does a good job of shielding your legs from the wind. The windshield is just okay. When set at the upper limit it directed turbulence at my helmet. A shorter rider might not notice this. The levers are adjustable and light. The bags are huge and will fit a large full face helmet with a GoPro on the front. They are lockable and also lock to the bike. 
I did notice that they can stick and take some effort to remove which may get easier as the parts wear in. Oh, and a full tank will take you over 300 kilometers of mixed riding. I have to mention the quick shifter because it almost ruined me. I can't believe I used to be skeptical about quick shifters and auto blippers. When you're riding fast in the curves, closing the throttle, banging down a couple of gears as you're approaching a corner, then clicking up through them while accelerating on the exit without a clutch was brilliant. So finally, let's talk about what this bike isn't, because I don't want anyone to have the wrong expectations. The Ninja is not great for all day droning on the highway. It'll do it, but if you want a bike that will do it better, buy one of the bigger sport tours or a bagger. Or at least get a more comfy seat, because the Ninja's saddle starts feeling hard after a couple of hours. It's not a great two-up tour. The passenger accommodation is fine, and kudos to Kawasaki for including passenger grab rails, but this ain't no concourse. Shorter trips are good, but two people are going to get cramped on this thing after a while. At 5'11", or 181 centimeters, the seating position worked for me. The legroom was where I felt most cramped at first, coming from an adventure bike, but I got used to it pretty quickly. At 5'7", Brooke felt very comfortable on this bike and found that it felt quite light compared to the roadster she is currently riding. The 33-inch seat was tall and wide, but she was able to get her feet down when sitting on the bike. She didn't ride the Ninja, but my guess is that she would be comfortable on it over the long haul. If you are a new rider and are wondering if this is the right bike for you, it's honestly probably too much. If I was a new buying this thing, I would definitely spend a few weeks in rain mode just to get comfortable with the dynamics before moving up to road. However, personally, if I was starting out and wanted a bike like this, I'd look at the Ninja 650. It looks similar and performs a similar function, but it's lighter and has much more manageable power. So the big question is, would I buy this bike? If I was going to get a motorcycle that I was not taking off-road, this bike would be on my shortlist. Though I did take it off-road. Why would I seriously consider it? It makes you feel like a super bike racer, has tons of features, especially safety ones, and comes in at a very reasonable price. It's not ideal for the super long distance iron butt stuff, but is more fun on a twisty road than the bikes that are. Really, I miss those old school sport tours. Emphasis on the sport. I hope they continue to be built because they fill an important need. The need for old guys like me to pretend that every corner is the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. I have a feeling that I wouldn't hold on to my license very long if this was my everyday ride. If you haven't yet, give this type of bike a test ride. You may be shocked at how fast and buttoned down it feels, as might your friends on their touring bikes as they watch you disappear up the road. So what do you think of the current sport tours on offer? Do you like the emphasis on the sport, the tour, or the newer breed of sport adventure tours? Myself, I like the sport bikes like the Ninja best. Despite the fact that it gives up a little comfort, it's hard to outfun this bike, especially in the twisties. So is the small sport tour still a viable platform? Absolutely. Life is a series of trade-offs, and sometimes you have to trade off some comfort for a whole lot of fun. The two things that make the Ninja 1000 SX stand out are value and fun factor. And if those are your top two criteria, there's nothing else on the market that competes. Thanks for watching and ride safe. If you're interested in any of the gear that Brooke and I wear or use, or the camera equipment we use to film this channel, the links are below. Everything listed there was bought with our own money and we are not sponsored by any company. However, the links below are affiliate links and the channel is paid a small amount for referring you to shop at no additional cost to you. We do not recommend any products that we are not satisfied with ourselves, but we do strongly urge you to do your research and select the correct size for items like helmets and clothing. As always, thanks for watching, your support is greatly appreciated. Please hit that subscribe button, give the video a thumbs up and leave a comment below. And whatever you ride, enjoy it. Wave at other bikers no matter what they're riding, we're all part of a brotherhood and sisterhood. Keep the rubber side down, shiny side up and may the spokes be with you.